Okay, and welcome. Hello, and welcome to The Sexually Satisfied Woman. I am your host, Eva Blake. In this series, I'm talking to a variety of experts who are uniquely qualified to discuss some of the most common challenges that women face in our sexuality. And good news is that over the course of this series, we're gonna offer real practices, proven strategies, share some stories to help you boost your confidence, ditch the shame, and create truly remarkable relationships even in these really uncertain times. And so it is my pleasure to welcome Catherine Hale today to our conversation. Catherine is a trauma resolution educator, coach and guide in sex, love and relationships and is an advocate for post-traumatic growth at the level of society and culture. She's trained in sexological body work, trauma resolution coaching, along with tantric and shamanic practices. She's worked with hundreds of people guiding them back into health with their bodies, cultivating relationships grounded in trust and compassion and discovering their right to live in connection with all that truly matters. She offers one-on-one -on -one sessions, retreats, and is devoted to the provision of trauma-informed care and offers professional training. Welcome here, Catherine Hale. Mm, thank you so much. Thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to just dive right in because it seems like that we can't really talk about sex in a holistic way without talking about trauma. And that's sad, but it's good that we are opening the conversation for trauma to have the conversation and to do the recovery that we need. And most of us, I think, think about trauma as something that happens to us from the outside, like a car crash or some kind of violence that happens to us. And then we're left dealing with it in our bodies and in our nervous systems. So can you explain generally how trauma affects our nervous system and how it affects our social experience with other people? Yeah, can I, can I just go back just one step actually before? Yeah, please. Question. So when we're navigating trauma, when we're talking about trauma, um, it can be really activating for people who've got trauma. Mm -hmm. So if you fit into that category, whether you've had developmental trauma or sexual trauma, I would advise you to listen to this and watch this interview in a really resourced way. So if we start touching edges, which are like really activating for you, then hit the pause button. You don't need to endure. You don't need to kind of be in this place of tolerating something that feels too much. You can always come back to it later. You can always come back to it when you feel more resourced. You can come back to with a, with a friend and watch it if that's what's most supportive to you. So I just want to name that before we go any further. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so back to your question. My menopausal brain has forgotten half of it. So can you just remind me again? <laughs> Absolutely. Really, the, the essence of it is how does trauma affect our nervous system mm -hmm. and our experience with other people? Because you've, you've talked about you know, trauma being something that affects our our sympathetic and our parasympathetic nervous system, but also interacts with our social experience. Yeah. Yeah. So we could kind of describe trauma. We could split it into two broad categories, right? So we could have like big event trauma, like the car crash that you were talking into. Um, but the more nuanced trauma is developmental trauma. So that's the trauma which happens to us as we grow up, as we're children. And really the first three years of our life sets the map for our, the way we relate to others for the rest of our life. So if we have these really positive experiences around you know, parents meeting us and what we need, then we're gonna kind of move into intimacy and sexuality with a kind of a map that works, yeah? A map that enables us to relate and to connect. But increasingly so, there are more people on this planet with developmental trauma. And so what's happening there in those situations is essentially there's a lack of safety present in the nervous system. So we'll have a tendency to, um, let's say we're socially relating with another person. What the social nervous system is all about is about belonging. Like I belong, I'm safe and I belong. And so as young beings on this planet, 
we learn to adapt our behavior to ensure our belonging. So we develop these kind of like uh, adaptive mechanisms that then play out for the whole of our life. So let me give you some examples of those so our listeners and viewers can, can understand what I'm talking into here. So it can be that we start operating from, I only get to belong if I don't have boundaries, right? I only get to belong if I go to unsafe people. I only get to belong if I tolerate pain and avoid pleasure. And you can begin to see how this could possibly translate into sexuality and intimacy, right? I only get to belong if I don't have boundaries around sex. I only get to belong if I go to unsafe people for sex. I only get to belong if I tolerate sex that's painful and lacking in pleasure. So this becomes like our limbic, that's kind of like the part of the brain that's to do with the social nervous system and emotions. We end up with these kind of limbic imprints that dictate on a very deep neurological level how we relate to other people. So I'll pause there and see if that answered your question or not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the helping us understand how our very first years shape the ways in which we um, create relationships later on or in, in, in ways that may be very, very unconscious. The, one of the things that as you were giving those examples that was coming up for me was something that I've heard a lot is, um, you know, I had to be on the lookout in as a young kid. That, that's something that I hear more than the examples that you gave necessarily. But so that's the one that, that I was thinking about and how being on high alert, right? Mm -hmm. Or like kind of dancing in some way or being a chameleon um, as a child, how that shows up and then how it's so difficult to then trust in relationships because the nervous system is like, whoa, we got we to gotta watch out here. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're speaking into, so your first example is an example of the nervous system in hyper. You're speaking into hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. So that's the sympathetic part of the nervous system that's feeling threatened. So with hyper, there tends to be a kind of... Um, like a, like you said, like an extension of awareness. And there can be um, a speed associated with that. There can be a kind of feeling of urgency associated with that. And then the other example you gave, the chameleon, like I need to fit in, that's actually a form of freeze. That's actually a form of what we would call like hypo, right? And the different kind of layers and textures and flavors of freeze. So you're speaking into the like, if I, if I blend in, if nobody sees me, then I get to be safe. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Can you just explain a little bit the difference between hyper and hypo? So our yeah. viewers understand that. Sure. So, so the nervous system for, for the sake of, this explanation is kind of split into three parts, right? We've got the social nervous system, we've got the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And when they are in health, when they're feeling safe, they function in a particular way. So in the social nervous system, it's like, yeah, I'm safe and I belong, right? In the sympathetic nervous system, it's like, I can play, I can dance, I can be active, I can initiate, I can move towards, I can choose to walk away from situations that don't serve me. And in the parasympathetic nervous system, for the sake of this explanation, I'm keeping it simple. It's like, yeah, I get to rest. I get to relax. I get to, like in sexuality, that could look like I get to be in bliss. I get to be in expanded states of pleasure and expand, expanded states of consciousness, right? So that's what it looks like in, in health and in wellness. And then if we were to look at that when there isn't safety present, the social nervous system is like, I don't belong here. This isn't safe. 
the sympathetic nervous system is like, oh, I'm either going to go into hypersocialization, which is people pleasing. The next level up is hypervigilance. We just talked about that. And the next level up would be like fight flight response. Like either I'm going to move towards an attack or I'm going to run away and get out of here. And then in the parasympathetic nervous system, when that's under threat, it's dissociation, numb, disconnection, isolation, despair. I mean, in, in its most extreme kind of manifestation, it's like impending death and doom. Right? Beautiful. So I think that, I think what you've really helped show is that there are, um, there's so much nuance and there's, it's, you really describe more like an orb rather than just like a fight or flight, like the two extremes of what we, I think what is common, um, you know, in dominant culture of at least what we know of the, these two options. And I think that's really valuable because we can, I, I know, as you were describing, I can even see some of my own behaviors or my own thoughts uh, as they fit into each one of these different categories and listening to the stories of other people, how their stories, they don't fit in just one singular category that you've described. And so, you know, with that, how, you know, how do we um, as adults now, right? If we know that we're in one of these categories or we're, we can resonate with what you're saying in different levels. So how do we, um, create or sustain relationships, especially intimate relationships, when we see ourselves going into these different responses in mm. environments where by and large we have safety, right? We're not under some kind of threat. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what happens in the nervous system, the nervous system is very sensitive and it can move from one state to another extremely quickly. It needs to do that, right? Because the whole purpose of the nervous system is to keep the body alive. So we need to be able to respond like that to a perceived threat. So if a tiger walks into the room, we're going to want to be able to run as fast as we can away from that. Like we don't want to be kind of thinking about it and waiting for the kind of like slow mechanism of the nervous system to engage, right? It needs to be like that. That's the kind of benefit of it. But the challenge is, is that when we're in like situations that we on some level perceive to be threatening, relationships, intimacy, sexuality can all fit into this container, then we can flip from one state to another quickly. So, you know, I often start with clients when I'm working with them, it's like, let's map out this landscape. Let's know the possible places that we can go to. So what I've just described, this is the nervous system and health. These are the three areas of the nervous system and health in regulation. And these are the three places that we can go to when there's a threat, right? And we can begin to see, so these are the type of behaviors that I'm going to engage in when I'm in um, hypo, for example. Yeah, my thoughts are going to get fuzzy. I'm not going to be able to, like you literally cannot think clearly. The part of the brain that's responsible for making decisions goes offline, right? Um, it's like, I'm less likely to be able to feel. So when we know that we have a tendency to go into that space, it's like, how can we prepare ourselves for that eventuality? Mm -hmm. How can we prepare ourselves for moving into the fight response, for example? Yeah? If we get triggered, if immediately we're like, Wah! I want to kind of like move towards and like have aggro with this person, then what do we want to know about that before we engage with another person? Right? So it's like shining the light on our behaviors is the first step. Like this is where I am in this like nervous system relational map. Mm -hmm. And then it's really good for the other person that you're relating with to also have that level of awareness and knowledge as well, right? So it's like, these are the places where we're gonna probably trigger each other. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? 
So it's like, it's literally, I, I talk about maps a lot in, in my client work. And it's like, you know, these are, these are the kind of like the danger zones. This is where there's a landmine. If you walk into that place, you know, that's going to be dangerous for you. Right. So whenever we're navigating complex territory, there needs to be a level of preparedness to move into that space. And so, you know, I know that, <clears throat> excuse me, I know that you work in the realm of somatics, right? And, um, you know, as a somatic pr practitioner myself, I know that it's a really great way of slowing the process down. So mm -hmm. for someone who, you know, wants to understand this or make a map for themselves, how would they go about slowing the process down in order to do what you said, kind of map out their own landscape in order to both be more aware of themselves, but also to be able to communicate that with people that they love? Yeah, great question. So what tends to happen for people when they have a tendency to dysregulate in their nervous system is that their capacity to meet challenge and difficulty is limited, right? So what we want to be able to do is to grow that capacity to be able to meet challenge and difficulty before we even start diving into our kind of darker crevices inside our psyche. And one of the ways in which we can do that is to learn to learn to start in health and wellness. So with trauma, there tends to be in, in, in the kind of, in people who've experienced trauma, there tends to be a negativity bias, right? And culturally, there's a negativity bias. We live in a, that, that's, that's how we live at the moment. And so we focus on the not, on the what's not working, right? right? So if we decide to orientate to health and wellness to begin with, if we start to incorporate resourcing practices into our daily life, like I'm going to spend like 10 minutes amplifying the feeling of stability, as I sit in this chair, by connecting with the parts of the body that are connected to the earth as I sit in this chair. If I start from that place and spend time there and notice the shift in my own physiology as I meet stability, then there's a possibility of moving into challenge and difficulty. So that's always the first step. When we start from that place, we um, create the possibility of establishing a momentum of health and wellness within our system. Can you give a couple more examples, just like we did? I mean, the stability in the moment, but you know, health and wellness, I think in some ways it's, those are buzzwords, right? So we don't, like, what does that actually mean in yeah. this context to develop more capacity? Yeah. So I'll use a phrase which is coined by um, Dan Siegel, who's a neuroscientist, who's written like loads of books on this topic. He's kind of got this idea of like the window of tolerance or the window of presence. And this is like, this is the space where I'm in capacity. If I go above this, I'm going to go into hypo. If I go below that point, I'm going to be in hypo. And I might get stuck in that place. I call it the washing machine, where you just go round and round and round, stuck in like reaction. It's a really uncomfortable place to be. For so sure. Like expand our capacity to be with that and, and to kind of gently kind of expand the edges. So the example I gave of sitting on the chair and connecting and finding stability is an example of like an internal resource. We can also call on external resources. So I'm looking out of my window right now and I can see, I'll take my glasses off, I can see a hillside and I can see trees. Now if I kind of really look, there's a river down there, right? So I can kind of begin to notice the, the trees and the hillside. And as I notice them, I can begin to tune into the physiology of the trees and the hillside, right? So it's like, oh, it's slow, it's steady. 
it's reliable like it's always there that view is always there and as i spend some time relating to the physiology of this hillside i can also then <clears throat> check back into myself and see how that physiology has changed my physiology I might notice the energetics of that hillside. So it's like, it looks actually really green. It rains here a lot, so everything's always really green. So there's like a lushness, there's like a vitality. And as I tune into that outside of myself, is there any of that emerging inside of myself? And it doesn't need to emerge, right? This is the thing with trauma resolution. It's not like we're forcing anything. It's like, does that want to show itself in myself? And does it show up like at 1%? And so as I tune into that my, in, in myself, something changes in me. And even if that's just a micro change, I'm learning to connect with something. And I use the word health in such a broad term here, but I'm learning to actually orientate towards something that feels well, alive, vital, healthy, as opposed to maybe stuck, anxious, hypervigilant, right? Beautiful. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. It's so beautiful that just the examples that you're giving that are so simple and are also, um, so close to our immediate experience, right? The, the experience of sitting in a chair and just noticing how you are related to the chair or looking out the window and that being able to be both in the, the internal and also see something from the outside and, and be able to take that in. And I think I also really love what you're saying about the effect of mirroring because, mm -hmm. right, if we're going into um, hypo or hyper, uh, experience in relationship to someone else, we are mirroring them mm -hmm. in some ways, or we're mirroring our environment in some ways. And so I love that you're offering this alternative mirroring exercise that we can do to find stability and or vibrancy inside of ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. And it, and it might be that we're looking for like protection or validation or safety, right? It can cover, it can encompass all sorts of feeling states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not just limited to stability. Right. And so now in this time that we're in where um, we're in lockdown or quarantine or these extended periods at home, right, where perhaps our, our external experience is limited or it's, it's definitely smaller, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious about... Um, what, what, what's some advice that you would give for clients, people who want to do this trauma resolution work and it is in an online capacity and they are at home and maybe there's not a lot of opportunity to go out and either experience the outside world or make contact with other people. Um, what kind of you know, suggestions do you have to be in the kind of online learning space and still be in the body space? Yeah. Um... It's a good question. I mean, in, in March, back in March, I, I put all of my work online in response to the whole of the UK going into lockdown. And I was curious to see how that would actually work with my clients. And what I see is a lot of people um, actually prefer working online because um, for some people, being in a room with someone else doesn't feel safe enough. And the online space actually gives us a kind of like, well, you're still over there, right? And I can, I can turn you off if I want to. <laughs> and I can, I can turn my video off if I want to, and you don't have to see me, right? So I get, always give those options to my clients. Um, but so coming into the body from that space, if we're feeling like, okay, I'm in charge of my environment, I get to choose how visible I am in my environment. Often that can give people the permission to actually feel more. Yeah. Um, 
And so I use kind of guided practices to support people to begin to sense, notice and feel at the subtle levels what's happening in their body. But always keeping it at a level that feels doable. Because, you know, our culture is like, let's push, let's overdo, let's extract, let's exploit, right? And so we don't really know where our limits are. We don't really know where our boundaries are. So we often overdo it. And so the kind of buzzword in, in my current body of work is like, what feels doable? And what can we lean into? And can we trust? And can we know that we only need to meet one drop of this in any moment? People are like, oh, I don't need to jump in at the deep end and realize I can't swim. It's like, yes, we're just going to go like we're on a little swing and we're going to swing into something that might feel a bit challenging. And then we can come out of it again and go back to that place where we felt really resourced. And that's the work, right, is learning how to strengthen that muscle of moving in and out and coming back to what feels healthy, well and vital. And not staying in challenge and difficulty and drowning in it. Right, right. And that, that pendulum swing, right, that we get to be more in control of it or more um, at, uh, in, empowered in it, right? So that we're, as you said, we're not locked into one side, right? Or it's not, we're not going back and forth so much that we feel completely out of control. Mm. Yeah. You know, trauma resolution work is about reestablishing choice. Mm -hmm. And I, it's an agency, right? Right. And I love what you said about the option online where we can turn the video off, right? And I can have my experience um, mm -hmm. and be, if I'm in my environment, then there is a different level of trust that I can have in my space, right? Rather than the traditional kind of therapy model where I go into your office and then it's mm -hmm. your environment and I'm on, you know, I'm in your zone. <laughs> yeah. This is really even, beautiful. Even if that is the case, right? Even if we are working in person, whenever we can do that again, mm -hmm. then, you know, the trauma informed way of doing that is saying to your client, right, how do you want this space set up? Where do you need things to be? Where do you want me to be in this space in relationship to you? What distance apart feels really good for you? Mm -hmm. Again, we're, we're um, giving the client a lot of permission to create the context that actually feels that it's going to be holding for them and safe mm -hmm. enough for them. And just thank you so much for those <clears throat> examples of things that we can ask mm -hmm. from the experts or the practitioners, the people that we're going to, you know, and we're seeking advice from, we're seeking support from that we get to ask them to shift for us so that we can shift for ourselves, right? That we're in this, this teamwork. And I think that a lot of times, you know, when we go to someone and there's this sense, I know this has been true for me, when I felt like I'm in crisis, mm -hmm. then I feel a diminished capacity to ask for what I want. It's more just like, oh, help, right? Yeah. Um, and so being able to ask the people that we're working with can I have more space or can you, you know, just like, can you back up some mm. is really vital. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we're kind of programmed not to ask those questions as clients. We don't, cause we're so used to, you know, going to the doctor and that, that model of healing, you know, which is like you sit down in that chair and, you know, we've all been there, you get asked the questions and in and out as quickly as possible and often leave those situations feeling like, wow, that was really disempowering. I lost my voice somewhere along that journey. Mm -hmm. So this is about, you know, the clients finding agency again and being able to speak into in a really kind of like tentative way, maybe to begin with, like, these are my needs. Yeah. This is what matters to me. Yeah. yeah, I need you to go slow. I 
need you to be right on the other side of the room because right now you feel like really scary. And so you're also speaking into something that, um, that you know, I've had a lot of practice with as a sexological body worker in the realm of intimacy and especially in the realm of proximity is that we might be working on the client's experience of intimacy or their struggle in intimacy with someone out there, mm -hmm. but we're actually practicing it together in here. So I am the stand-in for that other person, right? Uh, and I'm curious if you can talk about that dynamic in your work as you go much deeper with your clients around these elements that you're talking around about the, the experience of trauma and especially the experience of belonging, right? How we're like, I don't know, am I like you or not? Yeah, I mean, I think it really starts with this place of, I'll speak from the kind of like, um, practitioner perspective to begin with. So for me, it's really important that I choose who I work with because if I'm going to be, do really deep work with people, if I'm going to be working with them for five or six months at a time, then, I, then I've got to really like them a lot, right? I've got to like really love this client. Um, so, you know, choosing who I work with is key for me to be able to have those kind of relationships where we can deepen into, into trust. Having a really clear container, really clear agreements, so we know what it is that we're stepping into. It's like, this is, this is the playground that we've got. These are the rules that operate in this playground. And so, you know, that translates to, if you're gonna engage with somebody sexually, what conversations are you having first to create the safety, right? Are you talking about boundaries? Are you talking about consent? Are you talking about what you need? Yeah? Were well, all of these things being discussed? Are you talking about the things that trigger you? You know, do we know how to have these conversations to kind of set the scene so that we can move into challenge and difficulty together? And like, we're not being taught this stuff. Yeah, it wasn't taught in school when I was at school. Um, so we're, as a, as a practitioner holding this space for the client, we're giving them a new opportunity to have an experience of intimacy where everything is spoken about. Mm -hmm. Challenge. It's like, hey, you didn't show up for your, for your session last week. I'm curious about that. We have an agreement here, like what's going on for you? And naming the difficulty within the relational container and being open to resolution and repair within that container. So the client has a new experience of that. It's like, oh, I get to stay in relationship even when there's difficulty arising. Yeah, yeah? I don't need to run. Right. Right, or fight. <laughs> or fight, or freeze, yeah? Right, right, and I can, I can experiment. We can take it one step at a time, right? Yeah. Because so often in our personal relationships or like our workplaces, for example, like things are on a trajectory and they're moving and you have to like keep up with the train, it feels like. Yeah. So I, I like what you're saying around being able to, go so slow that we can just take it one step at a time from how close are we in proximity to just checking in with these kinds of simple questions. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to shift just a little bit to take this, um, you know, further into the realm of sexuality and, you know, how can we think about, you know, in the context of what we've talked about today, that the moments when we are um, uh, in in close proximity with someone else, right? Maybe we are body to body with them and we start to go into a hyper or hypo, uh, you know, vigilance or, you know, attention. We are starting to check out, right? What is something that we can be looking for um, in those moments so that we can come back to the moment? Yeah. Well, for me, it's actually taking it back one step before that, right? Great. There's the before part. Right. Like, how do we set up this space together 
to navigate moving into intimacy, right? What are the kind of questions that we need to be asking of each other in that space to set up enough safety to potentially avoid those triggers from happening in the first place? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the key questions we can be asking ourselves is, am I getting my attachment needs met mm. through my um, community, through the relationships that I have, or am I bringing all of my attachment needs to this relationship? And I'm using sex as a way to um, ensure that I'm going to get my needs met. Really good question. Yeah. Um, you know, am I choosing for a healthy partner to engage with? Or is this like a trauma bonding connection? Um, is there enough trust and safety present between the two of us to be able to step into something that might be difficult? Yeah, am I arriving at the threshold of sexual engagement with the other um, feeling resourced? Mm -hmm. Or am I already triggered? Mm -hmm. Yeah? What is my intention for this connection? Do we, do we have the same intention? What are my needs? What are my desires? Is this person going to be able to meet those? Um, can we start this connection with each other in optimum health? These questions are so, so valuable because there's something about them that really requires us to get out of autopilot mm -hmm. in order to answer these questions because they're not so simple as, um, you know, did we just turn off of our phones and so we left distraction out of the room, mm -hmm. right? They re these questions really are digging much deeper about where we are kind of globally in our system uh, mm -hmm. of of living, right? Mm -hmm. Much more so than just <clears throat> what is the, the moment that we're in uh, eliciting for us. Yeah, yeah. And so then as you do engage, let's say everything feels great and you're like, yeah, I'm ready to engage with this person. Then the questions to be asking are, can I stay with the experience that's happening rather than the experience that I thought I was gonna have? <laughs> Right? <laughs> oh, things aren't quite going the way that I want them to. Can I be with that? Oh, my partner's got triggered. Can I be with that? Can I stay present to that? Can I stay present to whatever is unfolding? Or do I have an agenda running that it needs to look a certain way and I need to be having certain kind of like arousal experiences in this connection? Right? Beautiful. Yeah, and these are really great questions for whether you are someone who has experienced trauma or not, because they really are questions about, you know, where are you individually in, in your whole system, but also what, what is it that you really want? What kind of relationship or connection do you really want to have? And I think that that's really, really valuable because so many of us you know, I know that it's true for myself. I've been in relationships where we just kind of got on the escalator and started moving, or we, we got on autopilot, or we got into a place where like, oh, I know them. We're just like, we're just going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then something comes up and we're like, whoa, yeah. it's not, it's not just working. Yeah. Right. And it's, mm -hmm. it's has something to do with the fact that, well, I wasn't actually in really in tune with these questions that you are proposing that we get really in touch with. Yeah. Yeah. And to kind of go back to answer your question about what do we do? Let's say we're engaging with someone and one of us has some kind of trauma response to the situation. Let's say, for example, um, there's some hyper fight energy that arises in the nervous system. If the intention is to stay in connection with the other person, it's like, how can we be with a felt sense of that fight energy not direct it at the other and still stay in connection. Mm -hmm. So no strategy is like, you know, allowing that energy to move through the body um, 
maybe maybe there's like an instinct which arises when you feel fight yeah maybe it's like the instinct of like the cat the big cat energy that comes in and we just start wanting to kind of like like growling and like baring our teeth and kind of like you know making claw action with our hands can we do that in small and doable ways whilst remaining in connection with the other right does our body want to actually kind of move in a bigger way maybe it's dance maybe there's an expression that will allow this incomplete trauma response to complete through some kind of movement it's brilliant it's brilliant so we have to we have to bring our conversation to a close at this time unfortunately because i'd love to keep going with you um uh, can you offer a couple words about the resourcing meditation that you're offering here so folks know how to engage with it? Yeah, so um, it's a resourcing meditation I made on the land where I live and I'm guiding you through how to connect to a resource that's going to be able to support you. And I think the resourcing meditation is about six minutes long, deliberately quite short, so that you can use it again and again. It might be like your morning practice, it might be like an evening practice. But by engaging with the resourcing meditation, what you're doing is expanding your capacity to be with challenge and difficulty, whilst at the same time, you are um, creating a momentum of health and wellness in your system. Yeah, so it well. might be something that you want to share with somebody who you're gonna engage with sexually, before you start, that's the like question. Am I resourced enough? It's like, I'm not. Let's listen to this resourcing practice together. Yeah. Great. What a, what a beautiful um, opportunity for deeper intimacy. Mm -hmm. This is something that I'm doing for myself. I would love for you to participate so we can do it together and be on the same page as much as possible. That's beautiful. Yeah. Catherine, thank you so very much for having this conversation with me today. I really appreciate it. It's such a joy to have a chance to talk with you about this really nuanced, deep conversation. Thank you so very much. And for- You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> great, thank you. And so for everyone else, please come back tomorrow for another really rich conversation around sexuality and relationships and just how we do it to make it good for us.